focus on the issue of dealing with slavery and human trafficking is called the Prevention Month. And we praise God for what the many things that Sandy has been able to influence others to be very impactful in dealing with this. So God bless you as we receive the word from Sandy. This 50. And, and when I travel, sometimes my um, jet lag problems uh, affect my eyes. And I looked at my Bible last night, and I was trying to figure out how to. So I printed everything. I have 31 pages this morning. Did you bring a snack? <laughs> hmm. So um, there's a picture that I posted on Facebook, and Tom grabbed it there. I'm standing in Hagia Sophia. On the balcony, there is a, a special um, diaz right there on the balcony in the Hagia Sophia, which was the big church in Constantinople. And the, um, the moment I stood there, I was overwhelmed with all kinds of, of knowledge about the history and response to being in that historical place, standing where in the space that re was reserved for the empress during the church service. And I had before, standing there, gone um, up this little back pathway that takes you from just uh, at the entrance to the big church up to the balcony area where all the women went. When you came into the church, the men went into the church and the women took this pathway up, 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 and then they observed. They were not allowed to be part of the actual um, service. And I, I was already overwhelmed with the fact that this beautiful church is now a museum that is overlaid with the culture of the day, which is, in Turkey, um, secular but predominantly Muslim. And so they turned this church into a museum because it was a church, but it's in a Muslim country, and the... Um, much of the art, much of the, the beauty was overlaid with the culture of the day. And yet, as I walked through Hagia Sophia, a church of wisdom, Sophia means wisdom, I kept seeing where, how they had painted over crosses. And now, because of time, the paint has faded and the cross comes through. And that reassured my soul and encouraged me because we live in a culture where our society, our media, the paintings of today try to block out the message of Christ and yet it comes through. So I'm not gonna use PowerPoint. Um, we would be clicking every few seconds because I'm going to cover 93 years in the next um, uh, 20 or 30 minutes. So I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because it's full of stories of people, of families that really messed up. I remember years ago talking to a young man who had met the Lord in our ministry when we were in Rota, Spain and hosted a coffee house ministry for, for Navy um, sailors. And he had become very discouraged. Even though he had pursued higher education, he had a master's of theology in the New Testament. But he was discouraged with ministry, and he stepped aside because people... People are just so unpredictable. 
And I said to him, did you ever read the New Testament all the way through? And he said, no, I'm a New Testament kind of guy. I said, you need to go back and read the Old Testament because it is not just a story of heroes. It is a story of people who were broken, who had messed up lives, messed up families, and yet, and yet, God redeemed their stories. The title of today's message is Do You See Me? In the national awareness, um, action, and impact to address the issues of modern day slavery, that is a question that we are constantly asking ourselves. Do you see the victims? We do trainings on all of the signs of what a human trafficking victim looks like. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, too. But the idea that slavery is something new is wrong. What we see today has existed for centuries. I want to look at the story of Joseph, who was a trafficking victim and a victim of slavery. And I, um, I, I was thinking I've always been really impacted by the story of Sarai's slave, Hagar. Do you remember in Genesis 16? Genesis 16, um, when, when God's promise didn't show up, um, Sarah got very creative and decided to give her slave to Abraham so she could have a child. And then when when that happened, Sarah wasn't very happy. She was jealous of her slave. And um, the slave ran away because of the mistreatment. And now Hagar is at a spring. And the angel of the Lord shows up. God shows up. God sees her. God sees her a slave. And this is what it says that he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Turn to the person next to you and say, where have you come from and where are you going? You see, we pass by a lot of people We go through car washes, restaurants, um, hotels, and we see people. But when God sees you, he wants to know where you've been and where you're going. He wants you to understand where you come from and where you're going. And so... I'm going to tell you my growing up story, where I come from. And a little bit, you've already seen where I'm going. I've been going for a long time. So um, I, I grew up, uh, started out in church. I remember, no, I remember the stories of my daddy telling me that when I was just a week old, they took me to church. But somewhere along the line, we, my dad's job um, took him away uh, on a lot of travel, and we didn't go to church as much. And then when I was nine years old, um, he was in a car accident that nearly took his life, and we went back to church every Sunday. We didn't miss any more ever again. And so from the time I was nine, I was studying the Word of God every week, Sunday school. Our children's church, I just want to tell you, um, Teacher Alice, Teacher Chris, they make sure our kids are learning the word of God. And I am who I am today because I grew up on the whole word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But I remember that night at a, when we used to have Sunday evening services, we were singing the song, Whosoever Surely Meaneth Me. Anybody back here old enough to know that song? My husband's the only one that old. And I was singing it on my way to, to school. I was in sixth grade. I was 11 years old. And I remember the red maple tree. I went back years later. And at first, I, I thought, oh, it's gone. No, no, it wasn't gone. It's just it was a little maple tree, and now it's huge. 
And I remember stopping on the sidewalk in the realization that I was the whosoever. The whosoever surely meaneth me. I was the whosoever. And at that moment, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior because I recognized that I need a savior. And that changed my life. I began to study God's word because it was the story of my faith. And I remember studying um, the book of Proverbs. I remember studying the stories in Genesis of Abraham and Jacob and Joseph. And I, um, I, I went on in school and did a lot of things uh, in high school. I was the president of our, of our Christ um, Youth for Christ Club. In church, I was part of the Christ Ambassadors in the Assemblies of God. That was our youth group back in those days. You could look at some really wonderful things, Colin, about Christ Ambassadors. I'll bring that for you. Um, but when I was 16, I um, in high school, I was... I was um, a permanent member of the debate club. I've always loved to argue. See, he's shaking his head. I've always loved to argue, and I'm really good at it. I should have been a lawyer, right? I won my debates. I studied whatever the issues were, and I knew both sides, so I could argue really well. And at school, I, um, I was not part of the really popular in-group, but I knew how to, how to bring people down to my size, right? Because I could use words so well. And, and when I was 16, I went to summer camp every year, church camp, help us send our kids to winter camp. We need to do that. It's life-changing. When I was 16, though, when I went to camp, it was really popular for kids to open their Bibles and choose a life verse. And I, you know, God wasn't like saying, Sandy Clements, this is your life verse. Nobody, I, could, I wasn't hearing anything. I opened my Bible so one night and I said, God, wherever my finger lands, that's going to be my life verse. Because I want a life verse just like everybody else. And I opened it up and it landed on Proverbs 10, 19. Everybody knows that. You learn that in Sunday school, right? It says, when words are many, sin is not absent. God just said, Sandy, shut up. Don't talk so much. And my, I, I still remember my English teacher because I was one of his budding writers and I wrote a lot of satirical essays. Um, he's, he saw my work when I came back as a senior and he said, what happened? I was like, this is my verse. And it was a very, very long time before God said I could speak up again. And I still remember when God changed my life verse to Pro Proverbs 31.8. And Proverbs 31.8 is not just permission to talk, permission to speak, permission to advocate. It says, be a voice for those who have no voice. I mean, that's, that's a reason to speak up. But it has a little semicolon there. So it is permission to speak with a semicolon. And my Vanguard students that are here today, if you take anything back to your class, take this semicolon back with you. Because we are commissioned to be a voice. This is a mandate. This isn't a, oh, everybody should think about this if you're called. This is in the imperative voice. Be a voice for those who have no voice. Semicolon, ensure justice for those being crushed. It is connected to action. It is linked to action. You can't just talk about it. You've got to be ready to do something. 
You have to know that ensuring justice is God's heart. Now, that's not do um, uh, com criminal justice. This is not calling you all to be law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and judges, although I know lots of wonderful attorneys. I wanted to go to law school, and my family wouldn't let me. Um, it's not about prosecuting and putting bad guys in prison. This is the kind of justice that reaches down and catches someone before they're completely crushed. Ensure justice for those being crushed. So now let's take, let's take some time and look at the story of Joseph and what we can learn about being a voice and ensuring justice. Genesis 37 through 50 covers a span of 93 years in 14 chapters. The Bible spends a lot of time on the story of, Justice, of Joseph. So I recommend that you spend some time. It's 14 chapters. Um, take a week and read the story of Joseph. Read the story of Joseph. It's a great example of human trafficking. It's an ancient story of human trafficking, which to me means we need to be aware that this is not something new. This is something very old. And some of the same things that we see in modern trafficking is that the victims are trafficked by people from their own communities over and over again. We had um, a huge case in Long Beach where we sent the traffickers, two women and two men, to prison because they were trafficking, they were Filipinos, they were trafficking Filipino youth from their home country. We see victims. My very first victim of, of human trafficking was a 14-year-old boy who was being sold for sex by his mother and stepfather for their substance abuse disorder over and over and over again so we when we see victims from korea from china from mexico from romania the traffickers are from those same communities so we can learn something here joseph was not trafficked by people who came in and kidnapped him he was trafficked by his own family. His brother sold him for 20 shekels of silver. And once he was um, taken by the caravan into Egypt, he was sold to Potiphar, who was the captain of the Pharaoh's guard. And that 20 shekels was about $143 in today's economy. Not even a lot of money. I know it's a lot of money if you have an electricity bill or a heating bill right now that you're looking at. But on the bigger scheme, it wasn't $1,000. It was $143. So when we talk about human trafficking now, we talk about an action, a means, and a purpose model. We, we look at how a person became a victim so that we can prosecute that case. We, we look at how that victim is rescued, and we try to figure out how to help them become um, reintegrated back into society. And that's where, that's where we need to take a little bit of inspiration and wisdom from the scriptures. Because when the angel of the Lord saw Hagar, he didn't swoop in right away and say, oh, I'm going to rescue you. Here's everything you need. We're going to take you to Target and get you all new clothes. He said, where have you been and where are you going? So I've been working with human trafficking victims for a very long time now. And I always <laughs> learn something when I ask where they came from. Where have you been? I find.